Hello students, I am Marjina Sultana, an assistant professor from Interpersonal Law College, Greater Noida. Today we will understand the doctrine of separation of power. Doctrine of separation of power assumes that the governmental powers can be neatly classified into three categories. First, legislature. The function of legislature is to legislate laws, to make rules which are to be observed. The second category is executive. The function of the executive is to implement laws or we can say to implement and execute those rules met by the legislature. And the third category is the judiciary. In the function of the judiciary is to interpret laws, to interpret the rules that are obviously met by the legislature and also to adjudicate upon disputes came before them. So these separation, the doctrine of separation of power creates three separate and distinct organs of the government with, which are allocated with the certain specific functions which are to be discharged by them, which are to be, uh, be performed by them. So this separation of the organs, separation of organs into three, three with the distinct specific functions is called the this doctrine of separation of power. So this theory presents us with the functional classification of the governmental power. Now let's understand the postulates of separation of power. As a corollary to this principle, three other things become necessary. First, no person shall at the time be a part of more than one organ of the government. So, same person or persons should not be a member of more than one department. The next postulate is, no organ of the government shall perform the functions of another. So, no department should have the power to exercise the functions belonging to another department. The third, the third postulate is, no organ of the government shall interfere in the functioning of the another. So no organ of the government cannot encroach upon the jurisdiction of another department. These are the three, three tests to ensure that there is a separation of power. The origin of separation of power can be traced back to Aristotle. But this theory of separation of power is associated with the French uh, political thinker or the French philosopher Montesquieu. Because it was Montesquieu who for the first time put forth before us very scientifically and uh, systematically something called the theory of separation of power. Montesquieu in his in his work, in his book, The Spirit of the Laws, this emphasized this tenets of the principle of separation of power. Why separation of power? The reason for the separation of power is the decentralization of power and to prevent the abuse of the power to safeguard the liberties of the individuals. If all the rights, all the powers of the government come into one hand, it will result into the concentration of the power. The moment all the powers is concentrated in one hand, there is a fear that it will lead to the abuse of power. So the theory of the separation of power is that the three powers of the government 
should operate independently of one another for the rights and the liberties of the individuals to be preserved. So, doctrine of separation of power is to ensure that no power is concentrated and no power is abused and that the rights and liberties of the citizens are protected. So we can say that this theory of separation of power is based on the principle that power should not be vested in one, one person due to individual's prejudices and uh, biases. It, was the, <clears throat> it is rightly said by the Lord Acton that power curbs and the absolute power curbs absolutely. So there, was, there is the need for the separation of power. Article 50 of the Constitution of India, which falls under the directive principles of state policy under Part 4 of the Constitution, provides for the separation of judiciary from the executive. It provides, the state shall take steps to separate the judiciary from the executive and the public services of the state. When we talk about the separation of power in the modern contemporary context, it means it is rather about the independence of judiciary because there is no full separation of powers. They are not, these organs of the govern, government are not watertight compartment. So, Except the judiciary, other two branches of the government, they, you know, they overlap their functions. So, in the modern iteration of the notions of the separation of powers, it means the independence of judiciary. And the constitution of India also uh, provides only these particular, uh, particular uh, provisions re in relation to the separation of power. When we study about the doctrine of separation of power, it is important to understand the principles of checks and balances. We know that according to the separation of power, there is three separate organs of the government functioning different separate and distinct functions, but we don't adopt full separation of power. These organs of the government are not watertight compartment. compartment. There is a minimal interference of the other organs of the other organs in its functioning. So there is some relative connection, there is some relationship between these between these three organs of the government. Let's talk about the legislature. The function of the legislature as we have discussed is to make laws. But the process of passing a bill in the parliament requires a lot of debate and discussion and compromise. So this relationship between the executive and the and the and the legislature is sustained. So it, the creation, the legislature cannot act alone to create a law. It needs to be approved by the president. The bills have to be approved by the pres president. President has the veto power. So if president vetoes the bill, it is sent back to the parliament. Okay, so for, for example, article 100 and the, uh, and the 11 talks about the, provides that the president has to declare his assent, his assent to the bill passed, uh, passed by the parliament or he can withhold his assent. Similarly, the function of the legislature is making of the legislature, uh, making of the law by the legislature is also, also checked by the judiciary. But through the process of judicial review, uh, judicial review, the court has, the, the Supreme Court has the power to review the law made by the 
by the legislature under Article 13, Clause 2. Clause 2, article, uh, uh, clause 2 of Article 13 of the Constitution. If, uh, if, it, if it contravenes the Part 3 of the Constitution, if it violates the fundamental rights under Part 3 of the Constitution. Similarly, the executive, the function of the executive is also checked by the other two remaining organs of the government, both by the executive and by the judiciary. How executive is answerable to the legislature and the executive action is reviewed by the judiciary under Article 32 of the Constitution by the Supreme Court and uh, High Court has also power to review the executive actions under Article 226 of the Constitution. Although judiciary is an independent body, an independent organ of the government, it also has some relationship with the other organs of the government. For example, judges of the Supreme Court can be impeached by the parliament on grounds of incapacity and corruption under Clause 4 of Article 124 of the Constitution. Judiciary is also related to executive. It's the president that makes appointment. President makes appointment to the office of Chief Justice of India and other judges. So it is important to know that these relationships are manifested in such, in such a manner so as to create demarcation between legislature, executive and judiciary while keeping the, keeping the infused infrastructure, a relative connection between the three organs of the government so that they can operate efficiently. So these principles of checks and balance is important while important for the these separate organs of the government can function efficiently. This was all about the doctrine of separation of power. Thank you.